with MW Therapy. It's time for something better in your EMR. You're going to use it a lot. Spend a lot of time with that. You deserve for something better and something customizable. MW Therapy delivers modern all-in-one outpatient PT EMR with the built-in patient portal, marketing automations, and billing features you want at a great value. MWTherapy.com, where switching your EMR is easy. And think about this. Where's your PT career going? I'm talking literally, ge geographically. Jackson Therapy Partners providing awesome adventures in patient care for physical therapists who care about where they're going. Find out about travel physical therapy and you at jacksontherapy.com and your CBD store. Get the ABCs of CBD at cbdrx4u.com. Uh, as we continue keep diving into the niches of Niche Vember, we bring on our next guest today. Uh, Alyssa Arms created her own niche. She, in the episode, mentioned some struggles. Yeah, there was a point here where she was being pulled in a couple different directions and had to make a decision. Maybe some of you have been there. Maybe some of you are there right now. She had to make a choice between where she was and where she wanted to be. And she gives some really great insight in how she got there and why she took the leap. Pretty cool. Uh, if you've listened to the rest of our content so far this month in Niche Vember, you know we're having a contest going on right now. We teamed up with our friends from Dot Physio and PT Website Secrets. We've got 10 winners eligible to win a prize pack. Each of these things is worth about 1700 bucks. And here's what you get. A Dot Physio domain name. It could be like, I don't know, pintcast.physio. It could have that domain name. Uh, a Weebly website that comes with it, two custom email addresses. And then you get to spend an hour with some experts. Christine Walker from PT Website Secrets and Cody, he's a PT, but also a great copywriter. You get to sit down with these people and, and learn from them, grab some insight. And maybe you want to launch your niche. That's a great starter pack to do that. So to jump in this contest right now, go to ptpinecast.com and enter to win absolutely free. Uh, let's dig into dance medicine with Alyssa Arms as we continue Niche Vember here on PT Pinecast. Are you ready to do this thing? Yeah, let's go. Let's do it. All right, welcome to PT Pinecast. We say we have great physical therapy conversations on tap. In fact, if you're watching the live stream, it says it right there on the bottom. Great physical therapy conversations on tap. At PT Pinecast on all the socials. And welcome, we have to bring in our cheering squad. There we go. Welcome as we continue on in my birthday month, in case people wanted to buy me a gift, I'm not saying you have to, I'm just saying it's a very nice thing to do, my birthday month, of Niche Vember, we bring in uh, our next guest on the show to go a little bit deeper into her niche, Alyssa Arms. Alyssa, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you. Uh, Alyssa, you're from the great state of Colorado, which I think has one of the top two state flags. You guys have a very cool state flag. I, you in, you in California. I'm a New Yorker. Ours is pretty boring. It's like, I, I don't even, I couldn't even describe it. It's just so bland. It b blends into the background. But I feel like California is cool. And Colorado is probably the coolest state flag. Are you like a native Cal uh, Coloradan? I am. And in fact, super, super, super local native. I've always lived in the same part of town. And the school I went to for yeah. kindergarten through eighth grade is right across the street from the PT school I graduated from and still teach at. So I literally yeah. made a circle around town. Yes. I like that. So you're like born, bred. This is your, you know, you're the one who gets to, la to yell at all the people who move into town and be like, oh, I'm local. <laughs> and you're from, you're the out of towner. Mm hmm. That means you're the townie, though. They get to call you the townie. That's all right, though. All right. So, uh, Niche Vember, we've been talking to a bunch of different physical therapists. We thought it was very cool to, I think it shows off the strength of our profession is how broad we can be or what your PT license allows you access to be able to go into. Like, essentially, I'm a radio DJ, physical. I talk to physical therapists. We can do that. And you can go into a bunch of different areas and niches. And, um, I like to start these th this this series of conversations off by saying, like, how would you describe your niche? Like, tell people, you know, what you what you get to do and how you get to do it. Yes. So I am obsessed with my niche. I do dance medicine, specializing in treating dancers. I've been a dancer my entire life and kind of figured out along the way that maybe I could do something with this. Uh, PT school on a clinical rotation was the first time I really got that inkling of this could be combined. And so I do almost a primary care model 
where hmm. people come to me directly. We're completely direct open access in Colorado. So people come to me all the time for rehab from injuries, but also prevention and wellness stuff. Mm -hmm. I also work at uh, conventions and competition weekends that come to town, do lots of presentations for the dance community, teaching at like dance educator conferences and things like that. So I do kind of the whole realm related to dance medicine, which is super fun. All I heard you say there was I overserve the people I'm excited to be around. Like you figured out where they are physically, like I'm at a conference or I'm at a recital, whatever, competition. And then where they are in terms of what they need. Like I'm either there after they've been un unfortunately injured or I'm there before to keep them out of it. Mm -hmm. um, you, you mentioned something there too. When you were on a clinical rotation in PT school, it made you think that you maybe I could you, you question yourself. Maybe I could do something like this. Tell me about like, what was that? That it's not an aha moment. Because aha moment is almost like, is like, like, aha, it's like outward. The moment I think you're describing is, I don't know if there's, if I've had a word for it. It's almost that in, it's that, that breath in, like, maybe it's that, maybe there's a, is there a thing here? So like, talk to me about that. Like when you were like that inhale, like, maybe like, what was it? And then why'd you jump after that? Because obviously you did, because you're here. Yeah. So I was on my second clinical rotation up in Washington State working with a PT who was phenomenal at everything that she did. She had been a PT for longer than I think I've still been alive at this point. Nice. Nice. Um, amazing. And people would travel hours to go see her. I mean, like she was the person to go see. And partway through my rotation, there was a girl who came in who was 15 years old, had some sort of hip injury. And my PT had done a ton of stuff with her, had even made custom orthotics to put in her point shoes, all sorts of stuff like that, but had gotten her back to normal person everything, but not ballet dancer everything. Mm -hmm. We were kind of talking about it beforehand, and I saw her for one session with the PT. I was like, okay, I, I see some things here. I was only maybe a year into school. And afterwards, I said, you know, next time she comes in, can I – try some stuff with her, kind of thinking of some of my dance background and just see where we go. In two weeks, I had her back where she needed to be oh. in dance world. And my PT that I was, or my CI that I was working with said, I never would have come up with the stuff that you came up with. And it was just combining things that I remember from dance classes, but now having the PT lens and kind of going, okay, wait, what is this actually working on? How can I use this together? Together, yeah. And that was the first time that something like that happened. And then there were just other times on rotations. And then when I was working places where it was sort of like, oh, maybe like you do have a specialty thing here. Maybe you could do something with this. So it's then so narrow though. Yeah, it is. It's so it. narrow. Um, and then like five or six years ago, I started my own clinic and at first wanted to just kind of serve anybody and everybody, but it's a cash pay clinic. And then after a little while, it was like, why am I trying to market to everybody? The dancers are really my area of passion. So that's where I leaned in a couple of years ago, uh, kind of right when all the COVID mess was happening and haven't looked back since. I don't want to skip over some of those things. So good on you, because it sounds like your CI at the time was like, the yoda of physical therapy in whatever area right so she, so she had some like some serious chops mm -hmm. and she was still able to say to you a student who's learning from her something as i think profound and um powerful as her so she's in a position of power and she she probably knows she's super good at it oh yeah right and she still had the like the um just the wherewithal to be like, I never, to say that, I never would have thought of that. Like, wow, like what a great compliment for someone who's teaching you something and obviously knows her stuff to, to be honest and be like, and, and to still be learning to, and to be able to say out loud, I never would have thought of that. Like, good right. for you. Like, that was awesome of her. Yeah. Because that's definitely. like anti-ego. Yes. And, it, and I mean, she was the kind of CI where, you know, she was so good at what she did and had such a reputation. I felt like I half the time hardly got to touch any of her patients because there was this expectation that she was going to be working yeah. with them. Yeah. And so it was like, well, we can't really have you do a yeah. ton because they're here to see me. Right. So when that happened, it was like, oh, Ooh. okay. I, I had a similar moment. And I won't say the CI's name. And there's no way she listens to the show because I don't think she liked me. But we were treating a triathlete and um, it was elbow. And I remember being like, I don't want to do anything with the elbow because I, I don't know. It, I just, I wasn't good with the elbow or I just didn't like the elbow. I didn't like the elbow. 
I like my elbows. I like that I have elbows. And I remember I asked him, it was, it was one of those moments where I was sitting there and I was like, Hey, um, can I ask, can I ask him a question next time he comes in first? And cause we couldn't figure him out. It was like two or three weeks. And then the next time it was like, Hey, did you change your swim stroke? And do you, are you doing that thing where you're supposed to, where you now like super point your fingers to the bottom of the pool? And he's like, yeah, and I hate it. I go, why? He goes, cause it hurts every time I do it. And I was like, and there's a thing right there. Right. And she was like, that's a thing. I'm like, right. That's a thing. I can't do that drill, but it hurts. But that's super powerful because you remember that conversation. Obviously, I, I remember that conversation. This is years ago, five, six, seven years ago. And um, those are important moments. Yeah, definitely. And that sort of, so that was like the fork in the road. That was your, is this a thing? And now you're here, but I feel like you skipped, I mean, you had to skip a lot because you're like condensing. You couldn't, we can't go through every day of your journal or diary between now and then. Um, but why did you decide to jump to take to take the leap? You said something else that I yell at people, especially people I help in communications, which is like, I who do you want to you know use your product or service? And they're like everybody, and I'm like, well, you're not Oprah or Amazon, so you or Walmart, so you can't market to everybody. But it's like almost counterintuitive because we want to be as broad as possible because especially if you're going on your own, you're like, I need to make enough money just to float and survive and buy cornflakes and pay rent. Yeah. But you were smart enough and bold enough to go, I'm actually going to flip the funnel. I'm going to be as narrow as possible because I think there's a thing here. That still had to be really scary, even though you're like, I think it's a thing, but it's it's still bold when you take the leap, right? Yeah, it for sure was scary. And I mean, I, I kind of went from this weird general plus work comp because I had a background in that plus the dance medicine stuff. I had all three of those going on and it was getting so complicated trying to do all of the different no. marketing messages and like, what the heck am I doing? Um, so, you're saying all yeah. the things that light me up. Yeah. You're trying to say and be something to so many different people and that's possible. Like you can be, I'm trying to figure out how to do that. Like, but you were, you were running into the thing that I try to explain to people. Like when they launch a podcast and I help people launch podcasts, I'm like, I talk to this audience and this audience and this audience. I'm like, that's McDonald's doing Big Macs and sushi and, you know, uh, spaghetti. It's like, I know you, McDonald's, McDonald's has a stove back there. They could do all three. But when I walk in, I'm expecting one thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not saying it's impossible, but you were, you were, you were life on display for why that's super difficult and gets confusing. You're trying yes. to explain how great you are to so many different peoples in so many different ways. It's possible, but it's harder mm -hmm. to do. So when you when you took the jump and you open, what, let's give up. What, what, where can people find you and like the name of the clinic and how can they look you yeah. up? Yeah, so my clinic is Back in Step Physical Therapy, and I'm in Centennial, Colorado. And when people look for you now, how do you? What's your what's your log line, as they call it, or your X Y Z statement, or your you know your one? Not even elevator pitch. You got less time. It's your falling off a building pitch. It's like one sentence. How do you yeah. tell people like what you can do for them? What's your line? I keep dancers happy and healthy so they can dance the night away and keep dancing on stage. We've done episodes on. Have you ever heard of this? The X Y Z statement. I do this mm -hmm. on Twitter every once in a while. That's that. I don't think I have any. I don't have any questions after I hear that, which means it's a good X, Y, Z statement. So people will say, how do you know when it's a good X, Y, Z statement? And just for the audience who hasn't heard me get one out of my soapbox before, X, Y, Z is we do X so that Y can do Z. And do, do your line again. Let's see. What the heck did I say? I keep <laughs> dancers happy and healthy so they can keep dancing the night away or keep dancing on stage. I do X so that Y can do or become Z. That's it, right? Mm -hmm. And I get so angry when people are like, I have seven years of experience in this. I don't care. You haven't said anything about me yet. I haven't heard about me yet. Not up. Oh, so I'm up and look at over there. There's a show on Netflix. I'm out. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about me. So you were, you got hyper focused. This is why you're on Niche Vember is because you got like blinders on and you got real myopic and being myopic and having blinders on 15 years ago wouldn't work. But now, because of this thing, the cell phone and the thing it's attached to, which is the internet, um, you're, it's easier to find those people. Yeah. But how did you go about it? Did you go to dance clinics? Did you, how did you how did you make sure people knew what you just said about your clinic, about what you're able to do for people? Knew that? How did you physically get rubber to road? A lot of it's just getting out in the community. It's been things of 
uh, you know, I grew up at some of the studios around here and have connections to people who then went on to open their own dance studios. So I went to those people first and just said, hey, I'm doing a thing. You know, can I do a seminar for you? Can I just like give you some information? Let's talk. Um, I started going back to dance classes myself and getting to know the dance teachers there. Sometimes they were the studio owners, sometimes just a regular teacher and getting to show people I am a dancer. I actually get this. I'm not just saying I know dance. I speak this language. Mm -hmm. I walk. And then I, I'm a, a West Coast swing dance competitor. And for the last few years, I always get spaces, vendor spaces, and actually treat on site and essentially do first aid and recovery stuff and, you know, whatever people need for the weekend. And so now it's kind of a given that at those events here in Colorado, I am going to be there for the weekend. Yeah, it became a staple. So all I heard you say there from a communications perspective is you walked, talked, lived, breathed public relations. And some people would think public relations, although define it as public relations is press releases and videos. It's not. Pre public relations is building a relationship with the public. You knew who your public was and you were like, there is a distance between us and there's not clarity, and I'm going to close that distance, and I'm going to find, I'm going to make sure that there's clarity and understanding in what I do. And also you enrolled that who I am, which is not only do I talk the talk, but I walk the walk. I am this thing. What is West Coast swing dancing? It is a style of swing dancing. Most people think of swing as the big band music and, yeah. you know, kind of vintage clothes and all that kind of stuff. It's it right. the modern version of it. So and the story goes back in the 30s and 40s when sailors and soldiers were coming back from World War II to the West Coast. The dance that they left knowing no longer matched the music that had become popular while they were away. Oh. So they modified it. And so now traditionally the style morphs as popular music changes. And so it's something that's constantly changing how we dance it, um, but it's super fun. Um, as a as a healthcare provider in dance, what would you do for someone like me who, in fact, was born with two left feet? <laughs> is there anything? To, is is there any hope? I don't know what it is. I have no rhythm. Um, I get real sweaty because I feel like everybody's watching me be horrible. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any help for that. Is there? No. I mean, technically dancing is organized movement to music. So, I mean, Five if you can like dancer. walk or yeah. do something, you're good. <laughs> Have you ever seen the Seinfeld episode where Elaine dances? Yes. I, I'm not that bad, but I'm also not good. <laughs> I just feel super awkward. And I'm not an awkward moving person. Like I was an athlete, played a lot of different sports. Mm -hmm. um, I remember my swim coach, I was, I played ice hockey and swimming. So I was okay on environments that were not solid right like swimming you have yeah. to be very uncomfortable or very comfortable being off balance because you're in water and ice hockey same thing and i remember my my coach being like someone had a broad discussion like why don't you like dancing i'm like i just feel like i don't know what the hell i'm like i know what breaststroke is and butterfly and freestyle and i know how to skate and stop and he goes yeah dancing's just whatever and i was like i'm not comfortable with whatever although the funny part is with speaking and doing whatever i am comfortable with whatever it literally is when i get out there i'm like everyone's watching how awkward i am and i can't get that out of my head this has been my whole life yeah well and that's okay as dancers the normal thing is we are klutzes when we're not dancing so really? i will trip over nothing run into really? furniture all the time i always have the most random bruises because i'm running into things but when i'm out dancing i never lose my balance i hardly ever fall over like it's that's funny fine. that's funny i didn't know that was a thing it is very much a dancer thing. You can ask yeah. anyone who's been like a serious dancer and they will probably tell you the same thing. All right. So you mentioned on site at competitions, pre, pre, prehabilitation to prevent injury. What, I mean, a lot of people say this, like, what's a typical day like for you? And they're like, no, there's no two days alike. Right. But like, walk me through, like, what's like, how would you describe to another physical therapist who you get to work with? Or, or I guess what, what you get, we know who let's go with, with what, what you get to do with them. I get to do so many different things. So uh, my youngest client, I think, was six years old. My oldest right now is 76 and is a competitive ballroom dancer. Yeah. Um, and I work with anybody in between. Some of them are professionals, a lot of pre-professional adolescents who want to go in to be professional dancers in the future. And so, you know, it looks very different along the way, but like I've gotten certified in basic point shoe fitting for dancers. So I can go through and say, hey, based off of things that we're already seeing in your feet and ankles, here are things you should look for in your point shoes that you're going to go buy next. Or um, I do point readiness assessments when they're around 
11, 12 years old, they're starting to think about going on point. And so seeing what they need to be able to do in order to safely do that. And I have studios that send them to me for that. I do annual dancer physicals where it's a head to toe assessment, including cardiovascular assessments to check them out and see how they're doing year over year. And then all of the normal, you know, kind of rehab stuff or exercise programming or things like that. So it's a lot of different things. And then on site, it's first aid, uh, looking at things that are maybe acting up and they want to get it taken care of to get them through the rest of the weekend or and maybe helping them with recovery at the end. Yeah. It just sounds like you, you just looked at the person and said, what are the million different things that a physical therapist understands? And you led with, here's what I'm able to help you do, not here's what I know and here's long, how long I went to school. And you led with them in mind. You led with the audience in mind. Mm-hmm. Yes. In terms of earning trust, um, dancer, uh, dance instructors, right? Those are their people, right? And I'm imagining, maybe this is the case, maybe it wasn't, that the instructor's like, I can figure this stuff out. Who's, I mean, we don't need this other girl. Like, who, what, who, who is she? What does she know? Like, why do we need, I can do this. So how do you, because you can't just beat them over the head and say, send me your people, right? This has to be a earn their trust and earning trust takes time. This is building a relationship. Mm-hmm. How do you do that in the nitty gritty and to, to earn people's trust so that they do send those people, they trust you with their athletes at a competition where they just spend a lot of time, effort and money on. Mm-hmm. So it kind of comes from a few different places. One would be when I'm actually in the studio myself taking classes, they get to know me, they get to see that I understand what dance is and Mm -hmm. sort of the dance culture. And I always make a point of sticking around afterwards or getting there a little early and talking with the teacher. So they just get to know me and eventually they learn I'm a physical therapist. Mm -hmm. I never come in and go, hi, my name's Alyssa. I'm a physical therapist. I treat dancers okay, now I'm here for class. Um, Usually it's my not so subtle PT t-shirts that I wear to class that give them a clue first. Any good ones? Any good ones? (laughs) I've got like a PT superhero one. I've got, uh, what is it? I'm full of sugar and spice and physical therapy advice. Uh, I, like I have that. several different ones that I wear. I steal some of those. We have a t-shirt shop on our website. I might have to yes. steal, like bend some of those. I won't steal them outright because I'd be <laughs> wrong, but I do like where your head's at. Yes. I like the fact that now this would, this didn't set out to be like a communications episode. This is very much still dance, but I think it's about earning trust in public relations. Um, you didn't lead with, I'm a physical therapist. Mm-hmm. I actually think that's a really, really smart idea. Um, I used to tell people, um, uh, new broadcasters, new radio DJs, right? And they were a lot of times a lot younger than me. They were like, you know, 21, 25, whatever. And I was the older, like 32-year-old. And they tell people, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a radio DJ and I work for this station. And locally, they were trying to get people to go, wow, that's really cool. You're cool. And I'm like, here's the deal. You're playing your card too early. A lot, And I'll just, I'll preface, a lot of times it was a male broadcaster trying to get use this as a way to get attention from a female. Mm-hmm. And they would play their card way too early. And I was like, you played it too early. And like, what do you mean? I'm like, because you're leading with, a, it's a brag. You're bragging about what you do instead of making it a point of interest or something. So you lead with, I'm here to dance. First of all, I'm one of you. You are without saying, I'm one of you. You're showing up and being one of them. And then when the situation is appropriate, you, the last thing you do is probably say, I'm a physical therapist. Mm-hmm. And that, because you've already gotten their attention and they're already like, she sounds like she knows exactly what I'm thinking and talking about and experiencing. Like, how do you know that? And you waited, you sounds like you waited until they asked to bring it up. You played your card at the right moment. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's so much of my approach with so much of it. I mean, even when I've gone, like there's a, a Colorado dance educators organization. I had tried getting in to do a presentation the first year, but was way too late on trying to get a submission in. And I was like, well, I'm still going to go and check it out and see what this is. Cause I, I am not familiar with it. So I went and I showed up and I had registered just like everybody else. And I was sitting and taking all the classes in the educators track. Cause there's also a student track for the kids. And I was taking dance classes. I was sitting in on sessions and periodically while we were just sitting around chatting, they would talk about, Oh yeah, I own this studio. I teach at this studio. What do you do? 
And then I would say what I did. And then ever since then, every year I've been presenting for them and I've gotten referrals from them. I've been asked to come back. From that, I got a teaching gig at University of Northern Colorado. They have a Master of Arts in Dance Education and I teach wow. a 12-hour dance injury prevention course for them. Um, that's like a lecture and lab combination. And, you, and you it's- teach that. Yeah, I teach off. that. Mm-hmm. I've been teaching that the last three years for them. Um, so, you know, it's just like I go out and do things and then stumble upon these other opportunities. Wow. What a weird concept you give. And then eventually it comes back. Like we have a, we have like a, a philosophical concept of that. It's called karma. It sounds like you give good like vibes and then I don't know how this happens, but good vibes come back to Alyssa. Right. But you didn't go into it looking for what you were going to get out of it first. You went in looking what, for what you could learn or give or experience, and the good vibes came. What would you tell someone who was sitting where you were that first time you had that, maybe this is a thing, like maybe they're in PT school, or maybe they've been a PT for 10 years and they've never taken the jump, about wanting to do either specifically what you type of thing that you do, like in the dance world, or just a niche. So I'm sort of asking the similar like question of everybody that is on niche member for the audience, because I think we need more niches. I don't think we need to be broad. I think we need to be narrow. Yeah. I think first of all is just figure out who your people are and what you're really interested in and where they are. What do they need? How do you get in contact with them? There's so much where I wish years ago, especially having lived here the entire time, that I had maintained some of my connections over the years instead of kind of dropped them and then realized years later that, oh, that would have been helpful to have maintained that network. Um, So, you know, just like start getting involved because you never know what that can build into. And I think especially early on, check out all of the different opportunities that are there. And it's not a matter of saying yes to everything because not everything is going to be a good fit. Not everything is the right timing or whatever the case may be, but there are a lot of things that could turn out to be very good. And like we were saying before, it's not necessarily what you're going to get out of it, but just go check it out, see what you learn and see what comes of it because you never know. Um, And I've had so many things come up because of that, of just saying yes and even just showing up once and seeing what it is. Um, It's totally worth it. I think you just, uh, I, I mentioned before, my definition of public relations came from a professor. It was uh, public relations is building a relationship with the public. The answer is in the question. I think you just caused me to change my definition of public relations or add to my definition. So it's not just building a relationship with the public. It is building and maintaining a relationship with the public. Mm-hmm. Because you you had said a second ago, like, I wish I had continued that relationship or you know, I wish I would kept that up because that would have been really helpful. Um so I think I'm going to look at that changing my definitions this many years into my career, because that is important L- landing somewhere, letting everybody know what you, who you are, or how you can help them, what you do is good. But if you don't continue that relationship and that really is sort of baked into the definition because the relationship needs to be continuing or the relationship no longer ends. But I think if, if you say, if you say building and maintaining a relationship, because it is on you, mm-hmm. it's, it, I mean, it has to, it should be a, at least partly on you to say that it's a healthy relationship if you're maintaining it. Definitely. And it's just like anything else on the business side of things. If you have one touch point with one person one time, there's you can't expect anything to come out of that. You have to have multiple touch points over a period of time yeah. in order to actually have something happen with it. And so building your niche, building your network yeah. is exactly the same way. I give presentations where I parallel um, a relationship, like meeting someone, getting coffee, going to dinner. And then I, 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 I parallel that with like a content relationship, like someone scrolling past a post that you made or seeing your business card. And when I point out that people don't just see you, that I saw a post that Ashley shared the other day, and next thing I know, she's my PT, or I subscribe to her podcast. That jump is long. Mm-hmm. But we expect that. Like people who don't create content are like, well, that's how it works. They see something and they subscribe. I was like, no, that's like me getting coffee with you and then getting married. Right. We laugh at that. That would never, that's not how it happens, Jimmy. I'm like, oh, it's not. So people don't see one post that you did three months ago and they, 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 they commit to you. But what you just had there, I think I need to amend my presentation also. It'd be like a, like, it's, if you meet someone or you start an interaction with someone and expect it to grow into something great, it's like a one meeting stand or a one, a, a one night stand it's like right. it's like dude a one night stand leads to i don't you know nothing unless something else comes after that 
And meeting someone one time leads to almost nothing unless something comes after that. I'm going to yeah. add that to the presentation. So now I have a yeah. one a one night stand parallel as well. <laughs> Perfect. Not that I know what those things are. Alyssa, if someone was to ask you what your what your greatest mistake was in this, I love focusing on, I can't just do the highlight reels, right? We can't look at Alyssa where she is now and go, yes. well, that must have been smooth. I bet she had no landmines on the way. We know there were some landmines. What's a landmine that you you tripped across or you didn't see coming or that you fell you fell prey to? Well, I think one definitely was just the starting way too broad when I opened my oh, own yeah. practice and yeah. and actually trying to do like three totally different camps of things like that was just a hot mess. Oh. Um, and you know there have been things along the way where you know, maybe I would find somebody who was a business coach or an online course or, you know, different things where it was like, oh, maybe this will serve my need, but just yeah. kind of thinking it sounds good, but not actually analyzing, is it the right fit for me right now? And sometimes staying in something too long and yeah. before deciding, you know what, why am I sp still spending money or time or whatever on this when clearly it is not serving me the way that I need it to serve me and just cutting ties and moving on moving on seth godin calls it the dip seth godin write, writes like business and thinking books and he actually like sort of goes the anti cheerleader route and you know some people would say like don't quit don't ever quit and he's like if he's like um smart successful people they do quit they actually they just know what to quit on when to quit right mm -hmm. so if you feel yourself it sounds like what you're saying is if you feel yourself jumping from thing to thing too quickly because this is going to be the next thing that saves me or this is going to be the thing that solves my problem or the opposite end staying with something because of something called the, the sunk cost fallacy well i've been doing this for so long and i've put you know x number of dollars into it so i need to see it to to fruition both of those things could be wrong yeah. like you know jumping around like crazy and, and having one one night stands with courses or concepts or, or paradigms or staying in a bad relationship way too long both of those things can be um can be landmines to trip on. That's yeah. pretty astute though, to recognize that and then to say, no, I'm going to assess this and say, I'm gonna do less. I'm gonna focus m all my time on this one thing instead of some of my time on all these things. Yes, and I think another thing too was, you know, there was a point particularly pre-pandemic where I was saying yes to all the things, okay. whether it was within any sort of niche or whatever, just like anything. Yes, I'll do it. I can make time. I'll make it happen. My schedule was all over the place. Nothing was predictable. Everything was so hard to keep track of, including myself. And then pandemic came along, kind of had me wipe the slate clean and gave me an opportunity to start rebuilding after that and deciding what actually fit on there, what I wanted to spend my time on and that sort of thing. And what I was finding through all of that was I was better able to make time for myself to take care of myself and not worry about doing everything for everybody else all the time. Yeah. And instead of having the panic moments where maybe business dipped a little bit and trying to go into overdrive and taking even worse care of myself, trying to make up for all of it, just kind of saying, you know what, this is the universe giving me a gift of Great. extra time yeah. so that I can do some things for myself, get myself in better shape again, and, and still, you know, do some of the other things in the background, but it's giving me the gift of time so I can reprioritize myself a little bit. And then it always seemed like once I kind of got through something, then that's when business just naturally started picking up again. And so now I'm just like learning to embrace the, the concepts from the universe that come to yeah. me. It's good for you uh, to, to recognize that. And it's still probably scary. Um, I get caught in that too. I, I say yes way too much. And the people that work with me on this podcast are probably in the background laughing hysterically because like every like three or four months, I'll have like a moment where I just go, I'm going to do less and we're going to say yes less. And they're like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then I wind up doing it. I think I'm getting better, but there was definitely, there has been no light switch moment for me where I've gone from saying yes all the time to not at all. It's definitely like getting better, but I still have moments where I need to be put in check and put myself in check where you're going to spin like a top and you're going to do all those things. I think someone said it recently and it was great. It's only two types of tasks in your business and they are maintenance tasks and then there are growth tasks. That's it. There are the things you need to do every single day. I need to edit a podcast. I need to you know, create the headline and create the thumbnail and, and, and post it. And they're tasks, things I need to do every day. But then there's the, I need to talk to people and I need to make relations, you know, build and maintain relationships 
and do things like that and stop and think and go for a walk and think about how can I do this differently? How can I innovate? And you can't be doing one, you can't be doing both at the same time. So you, it sounds like you, you took that pause from the universe and you were able to sit, breathe and say, this is a growth task. Thinking is a growth task. Like how many times do you look at your calendar right now in the audience? Have you actually blocked out time to think? And you're like, I'll just find a time to think. Cause I don't know, man, if, feels like thinking's terribly important and if you don't a lot if you don't a lot some time for it when are you going to think mm -hmm. how are you going to do that i never uh, asked you what you're drinking i usually do that at the beginning of the show we're 32 oh, yeah. minutes in so i can add what uh, what are you drinking this is a uh coconut white rum and pepsi jackpot i don't that might be a first on the show uh i'm doing a miller light because i was feeling lazy today and didn't want to walk all the way downstairs to get one of my fancy beers and i've been drinking a lot of ipas recently and it's a little much mm -hmm. uh thank you to our friends from owens recovery science a single source for pts looking for certification and personalized blood flow restriction rehabilitation training find them online at owensrecoveryscience.com i've been reading that copy for years i actually don't need to read it anymore i've had it memorized but they've been sponsoring our first round for for a long time are you ready to do something we like to call three questions Yes, let's go. Three questions. Let's do three. All right. Three questions brought to you by our friends from Physical Therapy and Balance Centers. Uh, on average, a private practice that joins the physical network grows more than 40%. So if you think about opening a practice, maybe you haven't jumped yet because it seems intimidating, or you have a practice, you want some growth, or maybe you're thinking about exiting that practice, they can help all those people because uh, they know practices find them online at physicalfranchise.com and they spell it funny it's f-y-c-i-c-a-l physicalfranchise.com uh let's see first question we want to ask who is someone the audience should follow to learn more about dance medicine who's someone you look up to that you're like yeah i love this person because they communicate so great and they're so knowledgeable there are so many amazing people out there that I never even realized were out there for the longest time. Uh, but I would have to say my go-to girl is Jenna Cantor. Yeah. Uh, she is the person who was the first one other person that I knew who did it. And I was like, oh, okay, let's let's be friends. So we always talk with each other and help each other out when things are coming up. It's amazing how Roger Bannister broke the four-minute mile when everybody said it was impossible and then – it's like when, once he found out, once everybody else found out it was possible, then lots of people did it. It's like once you find out there's someone else who does the thing, it's like, oh, suddenly it becomes easier. It didn't. Your mindset changed. And sometimes that's all it takes. Uh, what's something the audience should take a look at? Like a resource if they wanted to dive into dance medicine. Let's say they're sitting there and they're like, hey, I this is it. She's speaking my language. I love this niche. I want to go deeper. Where would you send them? There are a bunch of really good places. Um, so depending on what you want your focus to be, International Association for Dance Medicine and Science, they are the research side of all of it. And it's not PT specific. It's just anything dance yeah. medicine related. Um, I'm actually presenting for them in Ireland in a couple of oh, weeks. Sure. Sure. Um, and then Doctors for Dancers is an organization that gets people in the community all together and helps do on-site events at conventions for kids, as well as doing other services. There's, I mean, there's so many different organizations that have some of this information. Jenna Cantor is another one if you want to learn the business side of Dance PT. Uh, so really, I mean, so many awesome people out there. It's good to know those people and to build and maintain a relationship with them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, why should people care about dance medicine? Why is someone out there who's thinking about this? Like, why should they care? Why does it matter? Why does what you do, why does what Alyssa does matter? It is a very underserved community for a variety of reasons and has such specific needs as far right. as what they need to be able to do. They do so much that is outside of the norm of what the human body should be able to do oh, while making it look good. Yeah. Um, and to puts a ton of stress on the body and having the knowledge to be able to help them is really important. Yeah. Part of it too is historically there's been sort of a distrust of the medical community from the dance community because for so long, and I, I had the same situation when I was in high school, when I got injured, I went to my PCP. He said, uh, I dislocated my kneecap and ripped through some stuff. And he said, uh, do some squats, take some leave. You should be fine. Yeah. I was out of dance for three or four months because I couldn't, and nobody had any answers for me. And a lot of times people would just say, well, just stop dancing. Your pain should go away. I'm That's your identity. That. Part of who you are. It's part of your life. That doesn't sound like a way to do that. So, uh, it sounds like you became the PT you needed. Yes, like definitely. you needed, right? And if that's not deep, I don't know what it is. Yeah. Uh, last thing we do on the show is called the parting shot. 
Party Shot is brought to you by our friends, the Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy. Find them online at orthopt.org. They also have a uh, special interest group about dance. Uh, check them out. They also have a resource called Current Concepts of Orthopedic Physical Therapy. Uh, it is the, the map, the perfect guide to your OCS. No matter where you are in your career, they can get you to, a, to the starting line of the OCS confidently and competently find current concepts available now at orthopt.org so Alyssa, no pressure spotlight is on you uh but what's your parting shot last thing you want to leave with the audience as we wrap up Ooh, i think i'm gonna go with if you are somebody who is working with a dancer or anybody who is an artistic athlete reach out, find resources to help make sure that you can help get them where they need to be. If you're not sure how to use those resources or you feel like it's beyond your area of expertise, find somebody who does know because we are always more than happy to help you. Love that. Yeah. Be, be the PT or be the resource. Be the be the positive vibes and the karma for someone else. And I'm telling you, it's going to come back for you. Uh, Alyssa, thanks for jumping in uh, an inch wide, but a mile deep into uh, dance medicine as a physical therapist here in Niche Vember on the podcast. Appreciate that. Yeah, thanks. They said the best conversations happen at happy hour. Thanks for coming to ours. Like what you hear? Tell a friend or leave a review on iTunes or Google Play. The show today is brought to you by the Brooks Institute of Higher Learning, an innovator in providing advanced post-professional education. The Brooks IHL offers seven on-site PT residencies, including orthopedics, women's health, geriatrics, pediatrics, sports, and neurology as well as a neurologic OT fellowship, a competitive OMPT fellowship, and a speech therapy clinical fellowship. Therapists that complete a residency or fellowship through the Brooks IHL will markedly advance their knowledge and skills in a specialty area of practice. Learn more about how a residency or fellowship can help you advance your professional development at brooksihl.org. Our home on the internet. PTPintCast.com Created by Build PT. Build PT provides marketing services specifically for private practice PTs. From website development and hosting. Providing content marketing solutions for PT clinics across the country. See what Build PT can do for you today at BuildPT.com. The PT Pinecast is a product of PT Pinecast LLC. It is hosted and produced by PT Pinecast CEO Jim McKay and CBO Sky Donovan from Marymount University. We talk PT, drink beer, and record it. This has been a Another pour from the PT Pinecast. The PT Pinecast is intended for educational purposes only. No clinical decision making should be based solely on one source. While care is taken to ensure accuracy, factual errors can be present. More on the show at ptpinecast.com.